I must confess that I tread into my topic today, namely early uh, medieval British urbanism with great awe. Uh, the reason being trespassing into foreign territory, so to speak, and this is, I guess, where leisure can sort of return the favor, uh, and I'm all, all for it. Uh, to put it short, though, urban studies have uh, been on the rise for a few decades now. As far as my historiographical research has shown, they are being carried out primarily by archaeologists, and I'm not one, I'm a historian. On the one hand, this allows me, a historian, to bring a new meta-analytical perspective into an already established field. And this is exactly what I will try to outline today. Still, being an outsider, I might be knocking on an open door, if you know what I mean. Uh, I do not exclude that what I'm going to talk about shortly might be so well known to my colleagues in archaeology that they simply do not consider it worth elaborating on. To summarize, my presentation today is my own reflections of a historian rather than a fully-fledged draft of an article, let alone a theory. The article that Johan just mentioned was a popular article for a youth magazine, so it was not a very academic piece in itself. In fact, the editor had to completely rewrite my text because my English was too elaborate for the American youngsters. Um, sorry for that. <laughs> um, that's not to say that I'm bragging, it's just that it's, it's not a very academic piece yet. For this reason, I will be very glad to hear what you have to say about my observations and any feedback on applicability of my thesis will be very welcome. With this disclaimer out of the way, let us now proceed to, so to speak, the main course. First, I would like to narrow the scope of my presentation today. I will be talking about towns and urbanism in the English part of Britain, that is to say, I'll exclude Wales and Scotland just for now. To this end, I will often use the term Anglo-Saxon, since the period I'm covering today stretches from the 5th to the 11th century. Secondly, as briefly alluded to earlier, urban studies in Britain have been on the rise for quite some time, but it seems to me that each site or unit in the urban grid is being studied on an individual basis. No one, it appears, has tried to sketch out a comprehensive history of Anglo-Saxon towns as a whole, as a phenomenon in its own right. Although I might be wrong here, and once again, if anyone uh, knows uh, examples to the contrary, I will be very glad to hear them. Uh, sure, there are numerous articles and book chapters, but they mostly address only individual topics, and uh, this is as far as I'm aware. So what I'll try to accomplish is to present one of the possible frameworks of Anglo-Saxon urban development up until the year 1066, and that is the year of the Norman Conquest. Uh, more specifically, I'd like to offer a diachronic framework that might be used for further comparisons and investigations. I believe that such framework should hinge on three key points, origins, functions, and regionality. And each of them coincidentally also consists of three constituents, although this was not by my mm, um, original design, this came out a bit naturally. Uh, in terms of origins, we can trace three main waves of town foundations before the Norman Conquest. Chronologically, the earliest are the Roman and post-Roman towns. Discounting the small wiki and legionary forces, fortresses, Roman Britain featured 17 towns of three types. The four major cities were the Coloniae, in order of, of establishment they were Gloucester, Lincoln, Gloucester, uh, I'm sorry, Colchester, Lincoln, uh, Gloucester, and later York. Their citizens were retired veteran soldiers with all privileges of Roman citizenship. Uh, then there was one Roman municipium, modern St. Albans in Hertfordshire, whose dwellers also were Roman citizens. Finally, we have at least 13 civitates, and these were the centers of the administration of a former ter uh, tribal territories. Please note that the status of London changed over time, and so it has been excluded from this list. Uh, it enjoyed a special position in the nomenclature. And also keep in mind that uh, the list above is not com completely exhaustive. There existed other smaller settlements as well. Uh, on the slide here, you can see an aerial view of Sirencester in Gloucestershire, and as it is reconstructed in its Roman heyday. None of the towns on the list completely ceased to be inhabited after the withdrawal of their Roman administration. As is easily observable, many modern British towns still contain Latin elements within their names, such as Castrum, Colonia, or Strata. Nevertheless, all, all Rom Romano-British towns shrunk in sizes and importance after the collapse of the imperial control and Germanic migrations. 
The next wave of foundations or refoundations occurred in the 7th century when England became involved into the new trade network around the North Sea Basin. Its links are commonly referred to as Emporia or Weekers in Old English, and they included such towns as Ribe here in Denmark, Quentevic in modern France, and Dorestad in the modern Netherlands. In Britain, some Emporia were the continuation of the Roman settlement. Uh, such was, for example, Ipswich in Suffolk, although Ipswich was uh, built close to a villa, or rather a, a villa-like site and not exactly a town. Um, others were totally new. The prime example would be the West Saxon Hamwick, which uh, ceased to exist in the 9th century, and the population supposedly moved to the uh, uh, closely uh, located uh, Southampton, about two kilometers away from Hamwick. Uh, and the third, and I guess the most prevalent type by far, was the combination of the two. York and London are the most readily available specimens in this group. The latter, as has been shown by Alan Vines and Martin Biddle in 1984, functioned as a binary system. The post-Roman Lundenburg uh, was, to quote Damien Tyler, a sparsely populated, high-status ecclesiastical and administrative center. And it was here that the economic activity of mid-Saxon London took place, end quote. Um, it is not clear whether the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it was the London Vic where the uh, uh, trade, trading activity took place, my bad. Um, although it is not clear whether the, whether the development of the weakers in England owed to the royal initiatives, uh, the kings certainly benefited from it. Uh, nor can we actually be sure that the Scandinavian pirate incursions of the first half of the 9th century were the sole cause for the failure of the Emporian network, but its collapse occurred nevertheless. It is the last third of the 9th century that saw the third major wave of Anglo-Saxon urbanism. On the one hand, the areas under Scandinavian control saw independent urban expansion and after the temporary political and military stabilization with the treaty between Alfred and Guthrum in the 880s. As a result, there appeared the region of the so-called five boroughs in the southern Danglo that included Derby, Leicester, Lincoln, Nottingham, and Stamford. And the Viking, no um, the Viking York prospered in the north. On the other hand, the West Saxon defensive system led to creation or reoccupation of at least 33 fortified urban sites in Wessex and West Mercia. Today we colloquially call them burrs or simply boroughs. After the West Saxon takeover of the Danelaw, some of the largest Scandinavian fortresses were elevated to the new Shire capitals, and this was also true for certain Saxon boroughs as well. And this brings us to the second key point in the framework, the functions that the towns fulfilled. We can similarly discern at least three of them in their purest types. Royal and or ecclesiastical centers, territorial capitals, and commercial hubs. Please observe that these groups rather belong to the ideal type, type typical models of the Weberians in the Weberian sense, because these functions often overlapped. The first uh, type, functioning as a governmental center, included many West Saxon townships such as Chester, Wilton, Dorchester, and above all, Winchester. I shall dwell on the latter as the most selling case in this group um, and illustrating some common features. The site of modern Winchester had been inhabited since pre-Christian times and from the seventh century on, Winchester hosted a diocesan capital. Under King Alfred, it was significantly rebuilt and received its own borough within the defensive strategy. De facto, it functioned as the political capital of the English kingdom in the 10th century, but the inland location hampered the economic development of the town. So the second discerned function, that of a trade center, never took the lead here. An example of a successful commercial hub would, of course, be London after its annexation by King Alfred in 886. Before then, the town used to be, to turn to Martin Biddle's, Biddle's words, royal, ecclesiastical, and ceremonial. Thanks to its advantageous geographical position, however, London had access to both inland and foreign trade routes, which can explain London's uh, growth by the 11th century. And though Winchester remained the preferred seat for the monarchy, London's economic prominence eventually overshadowed the symbolic weight of Winchester, and it was in London that William the Conqueror was crowned on Christmas Day 1066. Finally, let's click, quickly review the third function, that of a territorial capital. 
The debate as to when and how exactly the English kingdom was divided into shires is still dragging on, but it is evident that the administrative grid existed by the early 11th century. I'll, br I'll briefly remind that despite some minor adjustments, this system had been preserved up until 1974, and even today it's largely intact. Some shires appeared more or less naturally on the West Saxon soil, such as Wiltshire, Hampshire, or Somerset. Others developed equally naturally in the Scandinavian territory, uh, while in West Mercia, the grid was most artificial and handmade, it appears. Reflecting these various origins of the shires, their political administrative capitals grew out of different foundations. Some, such as Winchester, used to be primarily royal sites. Others, such as Warwick, previously served in the defensive functions within the Burgle system. Major towns in the Danelaw, such as the already mentioned five boroughs, played the natural role of the territorial centers even before the unification under the West Saxon scepter. And the royal power had only to, so to speak, sanction this role, on, uh, this role uh, later on, thereby integrating them into the administrative machine. Bearing all of the above in mind, we can state that the Anglo-Saxon and the probably it's better to say Anglo-Scandinavian uh, urbanization developed quite unevenly throughout the country. And although by 1066 these discrepancies had to a large extent leveled off, three urban zones may be discerned. First, we've got the West Saxon polity in a broader sense, that is to say Wessex, Cornwall, Sussex, and Kent, virtually all of southern England that had been united uh, by the reign of King Alfred. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, but... That would be this region. Uh, this region saw the least interruption with the Roman past and was by far the most heavily urbanized part of the kingdom at the time of the Doomsday Survey in the year 1086. It has been estimated that any peasant lived within 10 to 18 miles from a town or a market in this region. Most of the sub southern urban sites grew out of royal and ecclesiastical foundations or fortified boroughs, which sometimes was one and the same thing. Second, let's look at West Mercia. This would be here. Um, this region resembles Wessex in most aspects but one. Uh, its shire capitals were royal only in as much as the administrative process was carried out by the king's appointees and in the king's name. As observed by Henry Loyne in the 10th and 11th centuries, rulers of the United England, I quote, tended to be based physically very much in the south, end quote. And uh, Loyne explains it with the greater degree of urbanization in Wessex. Last but not least, the Danelaw and the Viking Kingdom of York were integrated into the original West Saxon Kingdom last. This likely explains their contrast to the rest of the country. Albeit most, or almost all towns here started first as Roman sites, the urban continuity is largely confined only to the larger cities, such as London and York. No boroughs were ever built to, uh, to the east of the saxo scandinavian border either. In this region, um, there were only six diocesan capitals as opposed to nine in uh, Wessex and West Mercia. However, what unites these zones is the roles and, oh, that the towns and cities played in them by the end of the Anglo-Saxon period. Yes, they all differed in sizes, origins, and primary functions. But as Henry Loyne put it, I quote, the borough was in nine cases out of 10 a royal creation. By borough, he means more of an urban site. And this justifies the statement by Nicholas Heim that, I quote, urbanism developed out of the need to bolster royal power, provide defenses, and re-energize resistance to the Vikings, end quote. To summarize, by the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, towns had been firmly integrated into the political, bureaucratical, and administrative machinery nourished by the West Saxon rulers. Towns were the minting places, military garrisons, seats of courts of law, and shrieval residences. And it was in the towns that the presence of the English monarch was most felt. So to conclude, what gives? What are the potential applications of this scheme? Preliminary, I can see three. On the micro level, it might help us better contextualize local peculiarities for every unique urban site. For instance, we could identify certain simple parameters and fill out a file for each town. And on the screen, 
um, is one of such possible templates. Then, having collected similar charts for each town or each urban site or urbanized site, we could attempt at aggregating the assembled data in terms of statistics. So, for example, we can calculate how many Roman sites were, uh, la were later habituated by the Anglo-Saxons, how many shrunk, how many uh, ceased to be towns at all, and so forth. Finally, uh, we could adjust the suggested diachronic framework for other regions of similar development, for instance, continental Germany or Scandinavia, and by collating them against each other, delineate de the common and the unique in time and space. Uh, this also brings um, another idea to mind. In 1974, uh, my colleague, well, I can't say my colleagues, but my predecessors in Leningrad, um, developed a whole uh, concept of the open trade and artisan site uh, for Eastern Europe, or specifically for Rus or Russia, which were not the same as the tribal centers and which did not uh, always overlap with the future towns. And so they also developed this kind of scheme of how the um, princely power integrated those sites into their administrative machinery some, uh, or whether they abandoned them at all and which functions were, took the lead in each particular case. Uh, but as far as I know, Rossica non legentur, and so this is largely unavailable uh, in English. However, whether this pursuit is going to be fruitful, well, that's a topic for another day. And on this note, I thank you for your patience and I'm looking forward to the discussion, should there be any. Thank you very much.